It's episode 987, and it's the Relevant Podcast here in Orlando. I'm your host, Cameron Strang, and joining me from Loverland, Virginia, it's Jesse Carey. Hello, hello. From Austin, Texas, author, speaker, podcaster, Jamie Ivey. Hey, guys. And once again, filling in for our very own Derek Miner from Colorado Springs this week, downtown Emily Brown. Hey, y'all. Hey, uh, Jesse, this is the last podcast, the next podcast we record. Next couple, I'll be there in person with you in Virginia. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm very much looking forward. I mean, Cameron knows this. I'm very I'm very proud of my state, not just because we have a very salacious state flag, which is prominently <laughs> hanging uh, in the room where Cameron will be staying. But uh, yeah, show him around, uh, Cameron. What are what is the you know? I was thinking of doing what we did when when I was like in fourth grade, which was go to Jamestown, Colonial Williamsburg. You know, see all the, the you know rich in history. <laughs> Is that, is that what you, yeah, it, a lot of reenactments, mainly a lot of reenactments. Well, I, I don't I don't care what we do. I just ha- I do have a question for you. I, yeah. I will be driving. We're, I'm road tripping up there in the electric okay. car, so that's going to be an adventure by itself. And uh, my question is, at the state border, mm-hmm. is it a situation kind of like when I'm crossing into Mexico or Canada, do they check that I am with a lover to enter the state <laughs> or as a waiting. single they person have one waiting as a very they one to you. Maybe oh. I will go to Virginia. <laughs> well, that's great because I'm very, very single and would love to meet somebody. Yeah. All wow. Right. Okay. Yeah. They're, there you they're, go. they're 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 just lined up at the border. Because I'm like um, going to the very, This sounds very illegal and shady. It says it <laughs> at the same sign. Virginia yeah. is for lovers. I'm assuming and lovers only. I'm like, am I even welcome there? I, yeah, it's you know, very so. exclusionary. But but we've we've done a lot of work lately <sighs> okay. to just line the borders with lovers. <laughs> so what you're so. So what you're saying is when you go to one of those fancy country club restaurants and they have a jacket policy for the men and you walk in, you don't have a jacket. Have a they policy. have a closet of available loner jackets for you. So if I'm going to show up at the state border with no lover, there is mm. a provision of available lovers. Ready yeah, Jimmy's right. This they does stand sound shady. At wait, lining the border of the state. <laughs> Even the remote parts. Quick. Even a lot of not people this are wandering going, over. We can't this risk is it. Going, we can't this risk is getting it. worse and worse <laughs> on lots of levels. Yeah, just, we, you know, we don't have a border wall. We Whoa. have a wall of lovers. And oh my it, gosh. <laughs> it outlines the state. Now, this I will say this bad. it's complicated because we're a coastal state. And so, oh. any. Anyone who comes in from maritime routes, until you they know, can be paired up, we with just someone. have waiting out on the coastline, <laughs> all the like, way up. They're, they're floating out there. It's a good system. It is a good. Our border system. wall is very complicated here in Texas as well. It's just different than yours. Ours is lined with spiders, not lovers. Yeah. Ours, ours, I'll say this: very expensive to truck all these lovers in. Yeah. Okay. Again, yeah, it keeps getting worse and worse. And worse. Dude, it's <laughs> very large border. So bad. Wait. So can I apply? Can I apply to be a lover, a Virginia State lover, like an official, like it's like an intern? Yeah, oh yeah, program. oh yeah. There, there's a website it, for some reason on the DMV site that you go in there, fill a little paperwork, <laughs> like um, like when you're getting your license, you check organ donor, available <laughs> lover, lover, lover. Yeah, border <laughs> lover. You put border it's lover, so border, bad. Lover. border lover. <laughs> Got it. Well, because the state is only for lovers, you can't be driving around single, Jamie. I get it. It's a very thoughtful program they have. So if I were to road trip, would I have to go around Virginia if I don't? Want to deal with the lover process? Well, that's what I've always done. <laughs> you could, you uh, could pick always... one up. You could pick one up on your way through, and then drop them off. <laughs> on the other this is border. so bad. Drop them off on the opposite. Kind of like the right HOV there. lane. They check to make sure your car yeah. has a lover that's in a the li- passenger last seat. Last time I checked, it was the- you pick them up on one border. You you know, drop them off on the way out of the state. And, but they're all uh, doing this willingly because this is where it gets a little shady. They love their state, like, Jamie. Yeah, they're just yeah, trying they're to they're do their part. It's so bad. to the Commonwealth. Trying to do their part. Come on. Yeah. I mean, we They're can't have back. a fraudulent slogan. You're right. You know, either we're four lovers or we're not. It's simple as that. We're, we're people of our word here. Oh, my God. Okay? It's a very, it's a very simple program. I don't know why you guys have trouble understanding <laughs> the parameters of it. After my one visit to Virginia, I'll never have to talk about being so, so single anymore. Oh, It'll be, my gosh. Yeah. Where's my yeah. self-deprecating humor going to go? I'll have a fulfilling, loving relationship after my visit this weekend. It'll be great. That's right. That's All right. <laughs> well, we have a great show in store for you today. I'm very sorry to anybody who tuned in to hear our guest, and they had to wade through that uh, <laughs> to get to him. Chad Beach joins us. He has a new book out on prayer. We're excited to talk to him. Um, 
stay tuned for that at the end of the show. Now, I'll be honest, we recorded the final segment out of order, so I already know what happens. Oh, we have a summer movie edition of Epic Battle coming up later, and you don't want to miss it. There's some very compelling arguments made for yeah. the, if you wait thought the you first the last five minutes of this podcast were compelling. <laughs> you just wait till we start talking about people, fourth graders bullying T-Rexes for the last 60 years. And and how important the number of fingers that minions have is and to whether culinary or not aptitude. Minions yeah. even have arms off the top of your head, close your eyes, picture a minion doesn't have arms. You tell me without Googling. I dare we all you. had to Google it. Picture a minion, picture a jelly belly. Which one has arms? Yeah. That's uh yeah. All right. Uh, stay tuned. Up next, it slices. You're listening to Day Glow. The song is Then It All Goes Away. Doesn't it always? Well, today's show is brought to you by Lumo, the Lumo Project. It's a visual Bible project that helps you see the Gospels through a brand new lens. It is beautifully shot, cinematically shot, and there's no filler. It is straight scripture that you get to watch. It is amazing. And also, if you've ever wondered if the Gospels talk about the big questions we face in life today, like fear and anger and relationships and money, it's all in there. And with Lumo, you can experience Jesus' teachings and story in a compelling, beautiful, visual way. Check out Lumo's free scripture videos by searching The Lumo Project at YouTube. And for other free resources, including small group studies and more, check out lumoproject.com. That's L-U-M-O project.com. Great stuff. All right, it's time for Slices. What do you have, Jesse? All right, I had a, and I know, Emily, uh, on the site, you guys were talk- you guys had posted something about this study, and I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on it real quick because I, I found it pretty interesting, and it's from Lifeway Research. And they ask, I think I think the, the initial pool was like a 1,000 pastors, whatever their methodology was. What they came up with was they had asked if they, had, uh, if they were familiar with, quote, the concept of an ind- individual deconstructing their faith in a way which systematically dissect and often reject Christian beliefs, the Christian beliefs, they grew up with now uh about uh 73 percent said they were at least somewhat familiar some said they were very familiar some said they're familiar some said somewhat but the large consensus again all three quarters said that they are at least somewhat familiar with this concept now i don't think it's i don't think it really requires me to provide any additional i don't think our listenership really requires any additional concept context for the concept of deconstruction but it's sort of the term that's been applied i would say that probably the term has come into fashion in the last i don't know five years or so where a lot of people particularly people who have grown up and in like either sort of like evangelical or evangelical like adjacent denominations are you know uh deconstruction is a great word because it's so visible but kind of taking it apart to kind of understand where the real truth is and i feel like it's kind of got like a bad rap to a degree because i don't necessarily think i think think deconstruction is part of a, a cycle of understanding your beliefs and kind of picking apart, you know, kind of what are sort of the political or social or cultural um, values that have got tacked on to the core of this thing. And what do I really believe? But either way, a, a lot of people have kind of gone through, especially kind of younger Christians have gone through some degree of deconstructing the, the beliefs they grew up with. Now, even though 73% of the, the pastors polled said they're familiar with the concept, only about a quarter, 27%, say people in their church have deconstructed. So there's this huge... Wait, they di- say no people have? Yes, only only 20, a, a quarter. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, a, a quarter say that people have deconstructed in their church. So 75% say they're aware of the concept, but 75% also say it's not happening in my church, which to me seems like, you know, the definition of like cognitive dissidence there, mm-hmm. where I'm acknowledging that this big thing is happening throughout the, 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 the church in the country. But most of them say it's not happening in my church, which to me 
like I, I, I'm not trying to disparage any of these pastors, but it seems like, well, well, where are all these people? That, well, you know? the thing I would even say back to them is maybe the congregation that you know and see every Sunday isn't in your, you know, what you would define as deconstructing. But my question is, who's not there? Where's the 23 yeah. year olds mm-hmm. in your church? Where's the 28 year olds? Yeah. They ain't there. Let me tell you why. And then, yeah. you know, like they're just, mm-hmm. they just are oblivious to who's not in the seats. It, because to me, it seems like a massive opportunity. Like, you know, these, these are people who are openly grappling with really big ideas and, and it, you know, welcoming those type of discussions, I feel like is a huge opportunity, but kind of the, the difference between people who acknowledge it's happening versus people who acknowledge it's happening to people around them. It almost seems ignorance is probably the wrong word, but it almost seems like maybe we should be a little bit more proactive about how, you know, we as sort of, you know, whether we're in kind of ministry or not are opening ourselves up to challenging conversations for the benefit of the people that want to have them instead of just ignoring that they're happening in the first place. Yeah, I think um, and I'm, I think Tyler mentioned this in the slice. Another thing, too, is I think so many people think of deconstruction as like a very obvious thing and they also equate it to what we can we call deconversion which is a different thing um and so i think a lot of pastors they may be aware of deconstruction but they're thinking it looks a certain way but like i went through deconstruction when i was in college it really just looked like me unlearning things and relearning things it was very subtle but if you were to ask me yeah i did deconstruct things because i had learned one thing took it apart, rebuilt it back up. And that's, that's all it is. But I don't know if pastors would call it that they would just say like, Oh, you're just growing in your faith. But it's like, no, that, that was like a big season and a big, like I said, like unlearning and relearning process. And I think that is what a lot of people are going through. It's not this big, I'm going to leave church for two years, figure things out and then come back. I was in church the whole time. I was serving at a church the whole time too, while I was deconstructing that. And I think a lot of people, A lot of pastors in particular, the reason they feel like it's not happening is because they're expecting people to just be super argumentative and blowing up in their faces. Mm. And it's like, it doesn't necessarily look like that. I think it does look like some people leaving. I think it also looks a lot subtler than we think it does. Yeah, A lot of people who wear the label of I've deconstructed, they're mad at the church. They have a lot of church wounds. And so like, they're more vocal about Mm -hmm. it. But in your experience, that would be my experience, Emily, where it's like, you just, mm-hmm. it's a natural mm-hmm. part of maturation and growth Mind to you. say, why mm-hmm. do I believe what I believe? And I've learned these things. How does that yeah. now hold up these other things that I held? You know, and like you just, you're evaluating and you chew the meat and spit out the bones and you are growing in wisdom mm-hmm. and growing stronger in your faith. I think deconstruction can be, is a very important part of the Christian journey. And it's not like a one size fits all thing either. And it definitely doesn't mean that you leave the church at mm-hmm. the end of it. You know, just because you're pulling on the thread doesn't mean that the sweater unravels. You just maybe are fixing that loose thread and, you know, it's good to go. You know, Mm -hmm. so like, you know, that's where I'm at is like, I think pastors need to probably listen to the, especially younger generations a little bit more and understand what they're talking about when they say deconstruction. So they can mentor it and mm-hmm. guide it and make it part of the healthy. Yeah, exactly. And, and right. be a part yeah. of the conversation. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like if, if deconstruction is supposed to lead to reconstruction, but no one is availing themselves to the yeah. process, it's probably not well, going to reconstruct. If you're asking in, in questions that, and the church know. won't talk about those questions, then it's like, well, then I can't find my answers in the church. Mm-hmm. And it pushes you out. You know, like yeah. there are, there is definitely yeah, exactly. a stream of Christianity that's blinders on that. It's like, well, you can't ask any questions because that's doubt. And if you have doubt, then you don't have faith. We're going to have faith and we're not going to ask questions. And it's like, okay, but I do have questions. Who, where do I go? Well, who do I ask? You know, and that's really where, yeah. you know, the internet and other <laughs> things have come into play to kind of take, the role of the church in some people's Christian journey. And I think the church needs to be aware of that and step up and start wrestling with this stuff. What does it look like in your church body? Maybe it's small groups that are more focused on that, that season. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe it's a Bible study class or something that you can say, Hey, we're going to go through and break down why we believe what we believe and teach it. You know, I think it's an opportunity for the church, but just to stick their head in the sand and pretend like it's not happening is foolish, you know? So, Mm -hmm. all right. What do you have, Jamie? All right. I love stories that make us all feel good. And there is a 90-year-old man named Tony Falou. I think that's how you say his last name, who has been working at McDonald's since 1962. He started there making, I mean, like 
what did he say, 90 cents an hour there, slice and cheese? Well, since then, he has at one point owned seven McDonald's franchises, and now I think he's down to a couple. But this summer, he had to close one of his franchises for renovation for three months. And you guys... Sweet little Tony, 90 years old, paid every single one of his employees during the renovation. Like every, all 90 of them. He hasn't, that's, I just was kind of caught off guard by 90 employees at one McDonald's, Mm -hmm. but he paid all 90 employees. And someone asked him recently, like if he lost any employees during the 90 days and he said all but two stayed because two moved away. He kept every employee. And someone also asked him like in a world that's so many people are like losing jobs and not working, what keeps your employees there? And you know what he said? Listen, this is your thought for the day. He said, you know what? Just be nice to them. Thank you, Tony. Mm -hmm. He's nice to his employees. They've been with him for some of them for decades. And he paid every single one of them while he was doing renovations. And I love hearing stuff like that. I haven't eaten a McDonald's in a while. (laughs) But this makes you you got a little hangering. I want to go to Tony's McDonald's, though. For you, going to get a McFlurry at lunch. Yes. Yeah. Go see Tony. Tony. That does make me feel good. That's awesome. All right. what What do you have, Emily? Um, mine is actually sort of related to Jesse's. Um, it's another LifeWay study that came out uh, that says a little over half of Americans believe that religious liberty liberty is declining in the U.S. Um, and a few more, about 60% also say Christians say that they are being confronted by intolerance in America today. So basically over half of American Christians think that they are being discriminated against and that they are losing the religious liberty. Um, and I think this is really important to point out because they're not. Yeah. They what liberties are they losing? They, I, 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 it started, I mean, obviously it's been building for a long time, but I think the thing that took it over the top was during COVID when certain states shut down churches yeah. being able to meet uh, the government overreach, squelching my ability, mm-hmm. that all that I think. And they just haven't gotten over that. Honestly, that's what I think. It, yeah. But what's interesting is this study was done late last year. So a lot of churches had already right, opened right. back up. But the fact that the government could do that is I think what they're all alarmed about, you know? Yes. And so it's really frustrating because I mean, I have friends that are international missionaries in places Thank where you, they Emily. have to yes. use like code words and they yes. are like sneaking Bibles. Like they at best could be deported at worst could they be killed. will die. And so it's yes. just really frustrating to see this study and see that over half of these people think like, Oh, I'm being persecuted. I'm being discriminated no, against. And it's like, you're still in positions of power. You still have spaces that you are able to speak freely. Now people might say things that they disagree with you, but a disagreement is not the same as discrimination. And I think that a lot of people are blurring that line and it's really frustrating because then it's almost like you cry wolf. Well, no one's going to believe you. So all these Christians are saying, or not all these you know, Christians are saying, I'm being discriminated against. Non-Christians are seeing that and saying, what are you talking about? You are being very loud and you, like, we have not taken away anything. Yes, churches being closed was maybe an infringement, but also there was a global pandemic. We had to do something. And it is really frustrating that there's so many Christians out there that feel like they're losing religious liberty when it's like nothing, nothing actually reflects that you, yeah, yeah. you know, just cause someone posted like, stop talking on your Facebook comment. That right. is not the same thing. That just means you have yeah. people that don't agree with you in life, which hate to break it to you. You're going to have that whether you're religious or not. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, American Christians. Oh, That's American Christians. And do a little bit of church history. And if you have like, the ability on, to yeah. travel, get, put yourself outside of your own travel context. For the love. Like yes. put yourself mm-hmm. in, live a life yeah. where you're yeah. not the center yeah. of everything. Like you know, force yourself yes. to be stretched and yeah. challenging. You'll all of a sudden re- realize you're not being persecuted. You're fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's not that bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Meet a migrant who has come here exactly. because of persecution. Exactly. I mean, just come on. Yeah. Listen yeah. to yeah. other exactly. people's stories. Yeah. I literally, I sat. Anyway, we've all had situations where. You sit and listen and learn, and it just recontextualizes your life. Uh, when I hear stuff like that, of like, oh, oh yeah, what yeah. was me? We're being, I just feel like you are naive and selfish, you know, and like you live in a bubble. Yeah. Yep. Get yeah. over yeah, yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. American Christians, man. All right. Uh, that'll do it for slices. Stay tuned. Up next, Chad Beach.
low end. There's there's just a lot of bands that have low and island in their band names. It's none of them. It's low island. The song is Can't Forget. Well, today's show is brought to you by BetterHelp. Relationships take work, including the most important one you can have in your life, your relationship with yourself. Taking care of yourself looks like a lot of different things, from eating right to exercising to seeking professional counseling. BetterHelp Online Therapy wants you to remember that you matter just as much as everyone else, and therapy is a great way to make sure you show up for yourself. Therapy is a helpful resource that gives you space to freely discuss and process the ups and downs of life. And BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. And you can even be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp Online Therapy. Right now, relevant podcast listeners can get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash relevant. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash relevant. Or our guest today is Chad Veach. He's a friend and pastor of Zoe Church in LA and also the author of uh, a new book, Worried About Everything Because I Pray About Nothing, to discuss why our generation has such a hard time praying and how spending time with God and the church can help us fight our anxiety. Here's our conversation with Chad Veach. So it's called Worried About Everything Because I Pray About Nothing, which I love the title. Uh, So I'd love to know, where did the motivation for this book come from or the message? Well, you know, like, and I write about it in the book, but like prayer has just been such a huge part of my faith journey. Like there's three kind of significant events with prayer that have kind of like really marked and shaped my life. But um, what really started me down this path of this book was a trip to Columbia. And um, I was preaching at this church in Bogota. And long story short, this guy, like, I was just so amazed with what he was doing. And I, I just, I'd never seen anything like it. And I said, what, what do you think, you know, what are you doing that we're not doing in America? And he goes, well, we're standing in his auditorium. It's he's like 4,000 people, you know, he, he's like, well, every Tuesday and Thursday morning from six to 7 a.m., this place is packed with 4,000 people praying before they go to work. Mm. And I was like, what? Like, 4,000 people show up twice a week to come pray for an hour. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of the things that they were experiencing, I was reminded that, you know, we need to be praying. We need to be praying for our kids and we need to be praying for our spouse and for our, um, here in DC. So our nation just, I was reminded of the power of prayer and it just took me down the path. I'm a, I'm a Bible reader. That's just kind of like by nature, my discipline, my daily habit. And not that I wasn't praying in my life, but I wasn't praying at the level or the rate that I, that I knew I, I probably should be. And so that's what kind of started me down this whole path of like, why don't people pray? Why don't we pray like them? And I thought, well, I think most people don't pray because they don't know how to, like, who likes to do things they're not good at? And I, and I, and it reminded me even of like the disciples, like, right. Like they never asked them like, Hey, like, how do we walk on water, bro? Like show us, or how do we turn water into wine or any of the things, the raise the dead, heal the sick, lame, blind, deaf, mute, whatever. The only thing they asked him was like, wow, how do we do that? Show us how to pray. And I think we're all still to this day, like, can you teach me how to, how to talk to God? So that's the start of this whole thing. You know, I feel like I've talked with so many people too that part of the reason they they don't pray is they feel like their prayers aren't being heard or they aren't being answered. Um, and so I would just love to know, like, what do you say when someone says that? Like, how do you respond when people, I'm sure you've heard that before. Yeah, and I experience that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, <laughs> we all have unanswered prayer, like all of us. Mm-hmm. And I think if we only pray so we can get answers, that's like using God as a genie in a bottle. Mm. Right. So you might as well just be like our Aladdin. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and so I think that, 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 um, we got to be careful that like, wh- I think one of the great things about prayer is that prayer reminds me, I am not in control 
his ways are truly above my ways. His thoughts are above my thoughts. And he, he's so good. He can give me mercy and comfort and, and, and peace. And I don't live on a planet that is going to be perfect. Like, I love the hope of heaven. I love where I'm going. But like, when I pray, it reminds me like, yeah, if God does not answer this prayer, it doesn't mean he's not good. Hmm. And it doesn't mean that I'm bad. You know, it just means like on this planet, like there's wars, earthquakes, famines, diseases, like sickness, racism. There, that, there's just like division. That's just part of this small planet. So part of praying is like, yeah, like he's not always going to answer our prayers. But like, I think maybe down the road, we would look in hindsight and go like, wow, thank God he didn't answer some of those prayers. Maybe my motives weren't even that pure in that interaction. And wow, he can actually work all things together for my good in spite of unanswered prayer. So like I have a sick daughter, she's 10 years old. I've been praying for her to get healed for 10 years because God has to answer that. Does that mean he's not good? No, it, it doesn't. It does, and doesn't mean he's not listening. No, but he has answered my prayers and giving me power and perspective and peace and refuge so I think we have to just redefine what answered prayers looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Your book talks about how, you know, you're worried about everything because you pray about nothing. And I think that word worried and like anxiety, there's so many studies that this like next generation is just the most anxious generation of all time. And so I would just love to know, like we, we have a lot of younger listeners that um, tune in. And so for them, I, I would love to hear how do you think prayer specifically can help with anxiety or addressing anxieties? Yeah. yeah so they say it's the number one issue amongst adults in America, right? We're, we're, mm -hmm. we're so anxious. We're living in, you know, inflation. We're living in political unrest. We're living, you know, in days where we're having to really address the, the sins of the past as far as racism. We've got a, we've got a social media crisis, you know, that's really inundating our minds. We've got, um, the great resignation, you know, we're, we're, we're just facing really tough times and imagine being in the worst place ever mentally riddled with anxiety and having the ability for the Prince of peace himself to come sit with you. That's really the invitation of prayer mm -hmm. is that, you know, I always think like, again, like, so many of us are bad at this, right? Like we're so bad at prayer and we, so we don't do it. I think if you're riddled with anxiety and you're, you, you deal with worry and you're not good at prayer, start, start so simple like this, like put a contact in your phone and name it God and just start texting God. Like text. The, and what I love about prayer too is like, it's the time I can be the most vulnerable, the most raw, the most angry, the most disappointed, like I don't have to filter my prayers with God. Like mm -hmm. if you read the book of Psalm, it is just like, this guy is like, I cry all night long. My bed is drenched with tears. Mm -hmm. Why in the world have you forsaken me? Like this guy is not playing church games. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I love about prayers. Like I can be like, I am mad. I am so kicked off. I am how did you do this again? Like, blah, blah, blah. And the Prince of Peace is like, all right, let's, let's, let's talk about it. Let's sit mm. in this. Let's not blow past this with some cliche Christian bumper sticker. Like, let's go through grief. Let's go through what's ailing you. And let me, it's the whole thing that Isaiah promised. Like when Jesus shows up, he'll give you beauty for ashes. To give you a garment of praise for the spirit of happiness, uh, heaviness. And that's the opportunity that awaits us in prayer. So I think, yeah, it's like worry, man, I'm raising four kids in LA. I'm trying to build a church in Los Angeles. We were shut down for 17 months. We, we, we live in an expensive city. Our city is known for crime and homelessness. Like what? We're, I could be easily stressed out. But I'm not because I pray for my city and I pray for my children and I pray for my church. And I pray over my soul and 
I got peace, supernatural peace. In the natural, I should be like freaking the heck out. But I, but I just, I refuse to live that way. That was Chad Veach. Make sure to check out his latest book. It's about to come out called Worried About Everything Because I Pray About Nothing. Tisk tisk. How dare you? Go check it out. Okay, stay tuned. I'm next. It's... Okay, it's time for Epic Battle. Uh, please welcome to the show, Relevant Senior Editor Tyler Huckabee, live and direct from Paris. This was such an important part of the show. We had him get up in the middle of the night and join us. That's right. Tyler, thank you for joining us for the game today. Would never miss an Epic Battle. Well, I've been uh, mentioning it throughout the show. <laughs> But this is a very special edition of Epic Battle. This is a summer movie epic themed version of Epic Battle. Now, what is Epic Battle? I mean, listen, you've been on the internet. Everybody's arguing about everything. You know, LeBron's the goat. Jordan's the goat. The Thor's better than the Spider Woman. I don't know. Whatever. People just like to argue. Epic Battle is where I put the scenarios in front of our cast and they decide once and for all. No more debates. We're settling it right now. Epic battle. Now, this is a special summer movie spectacular blockbuster themed version of Epic Battle. So we're going to have two teams. It's going to be Jesse and Jamie. Be thinking of your team name versus Emily and Tyler. Be thinking of your team name. And they are going to be given two people and two in a scenario. And they are going to debate to ultimately decide who is the winner. Epic battle. Uh, once and for all, forever decided. Okay, uh, what's your team name, Jesse and Jamie? I, I just feel like we have to be the Jays. I mean, that's pretty straight down the straight down the line. No one's going to get confused no confusion. There. Yeah, Jays. Just Jays. Keeping it simple. I like it. All right, Emily. What's your team name? Tyler. <laughs> Tyler. What's your team name? <laughs> well, I mean, we we came we came with one already baked in. <laughs> The editorial team. Okay. I should have known. No, oh my gosh. What a, what a flex. <laughs> that is. Baked so, that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, y'all should yeah. be seeing the editorial team here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Signing up for duty, sir. Okay. All right. So this is just a grab bag of scenarios. Uh, okay. The Jays, you have Parks and Rec era Chris Pratt. Okay. In the editorial team, you have MCU era Chris Pratt. Okay. Who would win between them in in a debate of the existence of God? Oh, gosh. Okay. The Jays, you're up first. What's your opening argument? Why Parks and Rec era Chris Pratt would be better at debating the existence of God? Listen, it said in the Bible... Come to me like a child with childlike faith. Andy Dwyer is is the is TV's greatest man child, arguably. Mm. I, I I don't know how mm. much better we, we could we, we could go than than a man that finds satisfaction in the small thing of life. Small things of mm. life. I could find a much more compelling case for the existence of God with someone who lives the lifestyle of Andy Dwyer than I could by some galaxy you know gallivanting superhero. Give me give me the simple stuff. Uh, Andy, that's that's all we need. Get, get a heart of gold. You're talking about. I just have a clarifying question about you said the lifestyle of because remember in a later season when he got the film roles in the off season he lost a lot of weight. They had to write it into mm-hmm. the show, and there was a yeah. passing line like, "How much weight have you lost?" And and they're like, "You've lost so much weight." Like, what did you do? And he goes, oh, "I stopped drinking beer." And he goes, "How much beer were you drinking?" He goes, "I don't know, fifty." 
Like, like, so he was drinking <laughs> 50 beers a day. And that's a lifestyle that's going to point you to the existence I'm of God. I'm saying, right. look at his redemption arc. When we started, the man was <laughs> literally homeless, living in a pit, directionless in life. When we leave him, he's, 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 he's a faithful husband. He yeah. has a, he has a, a career. He yeah. has basically a t- television children's ministry. I mean, Tommy, Car- <laughs> you know, Tommy Karate or whatever is basically like Jim and Tammy Faye Baker's old show. He's just singing and doing puppets for kids. Yeah. And he's sober. What a better redemption story and a case for, for the good news than just the life arc of Andy Dwyer. I rest my case. Our editorial team, what's your rebuttal? I got this one. So, Star Lord has traveled the galaxies and he has seen things that my human brain will never see. Mm. But from what I have seen of space, mm. that makes me believe that there has to be a creator out there who actually designed all this. So he's really mm. seen it. So he knows what's out there and he knows that that is not just casually happening. You know, someone orchestrated it. He's also met lower G gods in real life. So I don't think it'd be that big of a jump to go from a little G God to a big G God. You know, I think he could make the case of, yeah, there's one big God and I would listen to him because he's been to space and I haven't. Interesting. Uh, Jamie, final, final statement. Uh, My final statement for this is everything that Jesse just said, because I'm going to upset you guys when I tell you I've never seen Parks and Rec. Oh, it, it is. It is. It is a shame. But Jamie, if you're looking at a compelling case for a loving creator, just go watch an Andy Dwyer mashup video on YouTube. And you're like, OK, <laughs> this guy was on to something. What a story. Aww. What a life. You know, that's 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 what I say. Well, anyone that does puppet shows for kids. I yeah, he's like, singing, playing guitar, yeah. dancing around yeah. for kids. It's lovely. Yeah. I mean, he had a whole arc. That basically mirrored that of a young televangelist. Good on you, Andy. <laughs> All right, Tyler, final statement. I, I do think that there's something to be said for the fact that, you know, most of my theological training comes from Jack Chick. <laughs> and in Jack Chick tracks, you can always tell who the Christian is because he's a very muscle bound. He's a, he's a very superhero looking figure who comes in and, you know, look at all, you know, look how much God has blessed me with a beautiful wife, a nice house. And this is what could yeah. happen to you too if you turn from your wicked ways, exactly, that sort of thing. And now, you know, Chris Pratt is a, is a Schwarzenegger now. Like, he, he's, li- he's living a true dream come, a real dream come true, and he has many times given all credit to God for that. And uh, and, and I think that the, the, best, the best argument that he could make is look at my life according to the theology of Jack Chick, which I'm not necessarily endorsing here, but that is where I got a lot of my early training in theology. So that, that's, that's my argument. I think the Jays are the winner. I think the childlike faith. Good, good. The joy. They did have a good argument. Good yeah. That was yeah. good. Jesse's I mean, carrying one, us on that one. one. Thank you. This one to me was obvious. Yeah. Next up, the Jays. You have Tyrannosaurus Rex editorial just team. Just, okay. just T-Rex? It's a T-Rex okay. editorial team. Okay. You have Marcel the Shell with shoes on editorial Amazing. team. Okay. Who would win in a rock climbing race? Uh, editorial team, you're up first. All right. Well, I think this is a this is pretty easy actually for us for for two quick reasons. First of all, Marcel the shell with shoes on is is a shell, and shells are known for clinging to rocks. That's what they oh. that's what they do. They are you, you, when you look at any seaside any seaside beach any cliffs, then you see the then you see the the shells like kind of like dotted along it all the way up. That's that's they're very capable of climbing, and that that's how they survive. Whereas Tyrannosaurus rexes, man, they don't even have they got those tiny little arms. They can't climb. They they can't get can't hold on to a rock climbing. Climb. It's you just got you can barely. They don't even mm. come out past this big nose. Mm. So I I feel bad for the Jays having mm. to argue for T Rex here. I just don't see how mm. this is even close. Mm. Interesting. Okay, Jays. Yeah, you know the the thing that's interesting about Mr. T Rex is that he's one of the largest specimen that has lived. I mean, he's he's just gonna he's a, a large animal. The arms aren't a big deal because the feet are where going to get him up on a rock climbing contest. And so mm-hmm. the arms is basically like a little stabilizing mechanism to keep him keep his balance. It's mm. his feet and his claws that are able to just really handle any rock that would come his way because his feet were made for walking on rocks. Mm. All right. Editorial team rebuttal. <laughs> Final statement. Yeah, I you, I get what you're saying about his feet were made to walk on rocks, but they were made to walk horizontally, not vertically. And so, like, he his little arms aren't going to be able to reach because his body is so disproportionate. Uh, or she, their body is so disproportionate. Right. And they are just not going to be able to balance. They're going to be off balance because they can't, their little 
little baby arms can't reach the rocks. I would like to add to the to the to the judge, Cameron. I'd like to make something aware. Whoa, yes. whoa, whoa! Uh, can let's you, hear it, Jamie? Can you please? Do, uh, hang on. I'll I'll allow it. Whoa, 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 whoa! It. Flag on the field. I'd like to make something aware. Thank you. You allow me to speak. Is that I thought we were supposed to argue for our character, for our person. Yes, oh, but, but, but well, she's playing the angle of putting okay, counter okay, arguments okay. in my head right, about Jesse, your. Take it home. So she's sneaky. <laughs> yeah. All right, Jesse. Oh, can, can I make one more quick point here? Okay, please. The, the, you you guys are, are are forgetting the most important part of this. It's not about the climbing. Okay, this is a competition. Snail one side, T Rex on the other. Race so. up the wall. Okay, if that was just it, the snail would win. But guess what? You did the one thing that T Rex hates, and you made you you it's came after the arms right out of the cage. Okay, <laughs> you know how much <laughs> bullying that poor animal. <laughs> Has had to deal with even little kids are like, "Hey, T Rex is cool, but <laughs> look at those tiny arms! Can you scratch his nose?" <laughs> the T Rex has lived, has had an existence for however long. I always hear these numbers, millions of years, whatever. And guess what? He's been bullied by kindergarten kids for the entirety of it. He's had enough. Okay, you say something about him at the starting line, he's just gonna eat the snail. Game over. You shouldn't have gone there. <laughs> <laughs> no. Leave the arms he alone. He loves okay? shell. Okay, you can say you, 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 can, you can, you can make fun shell. of his sharp teeth. You can you can make fun of his roar. But you went for the arms, and he does not like that. And he's just going to eat you. And game well, over. he's also got a big head, so I can make fun of him for that. Well, he's fine on that. He's fine on that. He's, <laughs> it's, the, the head thing's good. You know, he's tired of being bullied for the arms. All right. So here's the deal. Tyler, you made a very impassioned argument about shells sticking to things. But you just now, a moment ago, said to Jesse that it's just a shell. There's not a snail inside of it. The snail is a thing that sticks to things. The shell doesn't stick to anything. So for that reason, that reason alone, I'm going with Trinosaurus Rex will eat the shell. Because the shell made fun of his little arms. <laughs> this is rigged. No. This is rigged. This, is, this makes no sense. You guys watch The Last Dance. Michael Jordan took one slight and he, he, you know, one perceived insult and he turned into six championships ring. You just, <laughs> you just insulted the apex predator of all creation. Well, if he was an apex uh, predator, he'd be around still. So <laughs> let's consider that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some apex oh, predator couldn't God. even survive past the Cretaceous period. <laughs> that might have been the nerdiest all thing right. you've ever said to <laughs> <laughs> All right, last one. Here we go. Uh, the Jays, you have Buff Natalie Portman from Thor Love and Thunder. Okay. Buff Natalie Portman. Uh, editorial team, you have a million minions. Mm. Between them, who would win oh. in Gosh. a chopped style cooking competition? Oh. Jays, you're up first. Tell us why Buff Natalie Portman from Thor would win the cooking competition. I mean, do 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 I have to do I have to go there and and use the the other teams? Oh, I for some reason I thought minions didn't have arms and I was just going to go right there and throw it right back in the face. <laughs> <laughs> They're very helpful. They build things. They they construct. The engineer. They doesn't. They, they've got six total hey, figures. Jesse, let me advise you against. Let, let me advise you against using that <laughs> argument because it got me nowhere. Got, got, they got six total fingers. I just looked. <laughs> hey, listen. I just looked. I didn't want to go there. They they've got six total fingers. Okay, chopped. <laughs> Have you seen Chopped? I don't know if they've been doing too much Chopped. Something happened to those other <laughs> other four fingers. Yeah, how do you yeah, hold a knife? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah and how yeah. they lose oh, the other four. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't think they're the best choppers is what I'm saying. If I'm just looking at the finger situation, I'm not trusting them around any blades. They're walking around. So you're not making a case that Buff Nellie Portman is a better cook or would do better? I have no reason to believe she is... N- Okay. Is 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 I I I know nothing about her 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 diet. I mean, I I assume she's been working out, and you know, I guess you do need to eat better when you work out to, you know. But what I'm saying is, you know, she can cook like a human with ten fingers. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not please anyone listening that has less than ten fingers. I'm not making fun of you. I'm just saying. Minions have three fingers and they're in little black gloves, and I just don't see them handling cutlery very well. That's it. That's the extent of my argument. <laughs> All right. Editorial team, what's your rebuttal? Listen, the Minions, they have done some insane things throughout history, and they've helped build a lot of things. So despite only having three to six fingers, I don't know the anatomy of a Minion, but... 
Um, they are actually very capable of doing things. They are also incredibly capable of creating the most chaotic environment you've ever seen, which chopped already a chaotic environment. And so buff hmm. Natalie Portman, I think she would already be stressed. And then the minions would be also casually making like a bomb or something in the background. And that would stress her out. And she'd have to go deal with that. And then they would just continue to cook because there's a thousand to a million of them. I couldn't tell you how many minions there are, but well, there's so in many the document. It says a million, a million, minions. There we go. million. So a million minions yeah. crammed into one chopped kitchen. No one's making anything, but the minions. <laughs> <laughs> it's like filled to the filled brim. To, the room is just stacked on top of each other. Natalie Portman cannot move yeah. her ten fingers, but the minions can make it happen. Oh, okay, all right, Jay's. Okay, so um, I saw Buff Natalie Portman in right. Thor, and I think that she can handle any minion. Also, mm. a thousand minions that might come her way. Uh, what about a million? A million. She can handle a million minions <laughs> million. Um, because I saw her lot. and she can handle anything that comes her way. I'd also, I I tend to like to just argue for my person, but I'm going to go and talk about the minions for just a second here. Please do. I think the minions, I've seen them a few times. You mentioned the chaotic and I'd like to, I'd like to stick on that for a minute. I don't think that in a kitchen, chaos works well. I mean, like Jesse's point, mm. they already have a disadvantage with their <laughs> cutler, cutlery skills that they might mm-hmm. have or not have. I also think they'd have to stand on top of each other to even reach the counter. And I think that could get a little sway mm. there. Like one person moves on the bottom and mm. it's just not well with measuring ingredients, ingredients and cutting things. And I just think their millionness is a big disadvantage yeah, to them. Huge, huge disadvantage. Mm. All right. Final statement for editorial team. Just real quick here, just just two things. If it if, it, if we're talking like the number of fingers, if that's going to be the the metric by which we decide who's a better cook or not, then we have <laughs> six million fingers to Natalie Portman's ten. That's an absurd seen, argument. Yeah. Yeah. It makes yeah. no yeah. sense to say that. It makes no sense. Say that. Worst case scenario, they're standing on each other's shoulders, like Jamie said. Whereas that's still three million. You're you're hugely outgunned. Listen, if they had six million fingers, if they had six million fingers on one hand or two hands, you'd have a case. <laughs> Okay, those six million fingers are spread around, you know, a million little weird, clumsy. They don't seem to have that good a vision either, Tyler. Look, the, you see the goalposts are on roller skates. Listen, You're moose the goalposts. You see the, the, the Coke bottle all over the place. Coke bottle I don't understand your argument. Wearing. They don't. I, I, I don't understand your argument. Near-sided or far-sided, either uh, way, it can't be an advantage. Can I reclaim easily. my time? Who's uh, reclaiming my time? Reclaiming my time. <laughs> who's, whose time is this? The second thing. And I know we're running out of time. I know we're running out of time. But I just want to say really briefly, and I've, I've discussed this, and I think when I said this last time, I said it with kind of an air of antagonism, and I apologize for that. But we do know through our previous research on this very podcast that the minions are all Christian. We don't know why that is, but <laughs> they are the subject of, 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 of we don't know Christian why. <laughs> memes. And so I believe that the Lord... I believe that the Lord would help them in this quest, and and I would call upon God's name for this Amen. chopped cooking stage. And of course, they would give they would give all of their winnings to their local church. Well, I don't know what that is, but they but I'm sure they would do that. So maybe they would, but that's not. Hey, the 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 question isn't who would give who would do the most charitable thing. I, look, Mally Portman's doing pretty well. I don't think she needs. I think she'd go to charity too. Okay, so if we're gonna play that card, she got all. She's in a Marvel movie. Yeah. She's doing just fine. Okay, she doesn't need to chop winnings. Yeah. She doesn't yeah. need it. She doesn't need it. That's what I'm saying. We need this win. See, I went, I went into the last round with Marcella Shell with shoes on versus the T-Rex open-minded. I didn't have an opinion. You guys convinced me. This one, I had an opinion going into it. I had a bias. Yeah. I, th- I had somebody who I thought was clearly had the advantage. None of y'all made the point that, I, that gave me that oh. opinion. Y'all made all these other finger points. The minions can, can build rockets, lasers, Precisely engineered things that require a whole lot of precision. I said that. Yeah. Well, Emily, Emily's kind of said that. But I'm saying, like, yeah, you, they can that. follow a recipe. <laughs> there's no and recipes they, in chop. There's, yeah. Hey, thank you. you that's, they have to think listen, for themselves. Hold on. They've have you heard before. the thing of a million monkeys and a million before. typewriters eventually will come up with Shakespeare? A million minions. That's a good argument. The sheer how volume. Many seasons, how many, you have how many more. Seasons? Is that how chop works? Uh, you get a million mignon. tries? <laughs> oh, I forgot. Maybe this group of minions mignon. undercook the beef. Eventually. This group of minions got Listen, it just right. I, I so forgot about just the new sheer... rules of chop this season where you <laughs> literally get one million tries and we take your best one out of a million tries. I forgot about the new rules. No, 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 no. No, they're internally doing it. Then they're going to self-evaluate and turn in one dish. They're going to... They, they're I, The minions would be buff Natalie Portman all day long. Ooh. 
Right. I cannot believe you made me defend the minions. I hate the minions. This is the worst. <laughs> I'm indifferent about them, but I'm sorry. I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to do this. I wanted, I wanted Buff Natalie Portman. It was a Portman. cute movie. All of them are cute movies. I haven't no. seen it either. I haven't seen They're it. They're funny. <laughs> I'm just making They're stuff up as I go funny. along. They're good. Like I said, I'm working off of me. I worked at a summer camp for two years. They are not funny to me anymore. Listening to kids <laughs> scream, be do all day long, made me want to like scream. My knowledge of the minions coming into this was I wasn't even clear of what appendages they had. Like I had to Google a picture <laughs> to make sure they had arms. <laughs> they would look like jelly bellies if they didn't have arms. They would just That's be like they, they look could in my still mind. Be buff I, Natalie I, Portman. I googled minion mm-hmm. skeleton yeah. while Jesse was doing this. They do have yeah, yeah. they yeah, <laughs> well, they win. I, so. All right. Think well, uh, score a 2 to 1. The Jays take it even though uh editorial team got the final round. Congratulations on your Thank victory. You very much. Epic battle. It was rigged. Fair. Summer edition. <laughs> all right. Congratulations. On your huge victory. Hey, before we wrap up, I want to thank Chad Veach for joining us today. Make sure to check out his new book, Worried About Everything Because I Pray About Nothing. It's available for pre-order now and it releases very soon. Don't want to miss it. Also, make sure to check out relevantmagazine.com for all of our daily content. And while you're there, make sure to check out our brand new issue of Relevant. Summer digital issue is there. It's available for free, featuring discussions about celebrity church culture, how you can transform your dating life this summer. Uh, we have Naomi Rain from Map City Music, Rain Wilson, keeping the rain theme going. Uh, we've got John Favreau, James Vincent McMorrow, so much more. Go check it out. It's available for free. Thanks to our presenting sponsor, our friends at World Vision. Check out their amazing work. There's a link right there on the issue page. And uh, yeah, t- take advantage of the free issue. Now, if you want an ad-free, beautifully designed version of the summer issue, you should sign up for Relevant Plus. It's part of it. You get an ad-free reading experience at relevantmagazine.com, uh, unlimited articles. You get an ad-free version of this podcast released early. You get an ad-free exclusive subscriber podcast each week and more. Go check it out. Plans start as low as two fifty a month. Relevant Plus, it is out now. It is a good thing. It's the best way to experience our content. Also, while you're at the site, make sure to check out our weekday devotional series, Deeper Walk, which is presented by Lumo. There's a morning devotional email you can sign up for, uh, or you can just check out each post in our faith section at the website. Hey, and last thing, if you like this show, you've been listening a long time, you're new, wherever you listen, it helps us. We love seeing the feedback. It helps people discover the show as well, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else. We're on YouTube. We're on SoundCloud. I don't think you can rate it and review it on SoundCloud and YouTube. Well, I guess you can on YouTube. But anyway, we love seeing the feedback and the ratings help the algorithm. So help us out. Tell us what you think. If you don't like the show, keep it to yourself. But if you like it, tell us. Okay, on that note, we'll wrap it up. I'm Cameron Strang. I'm Jesse Carey. I'm Jamie Ivey. I'm Emily Brown. We'll see you next time. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks for listening to The Relevant Podcast. Check out our features, interviews, and news updates every day at relevantmagazine.com. And make sure to follow Relevant on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest. For more great podcasts, browse the shows on the Relevant Podcast Network, which you can find at our site. And while you're there, don't miss the all-new era of Relevant Magazine. A new issue releases every other month at RelevantMagazine.com. I'll say this very expensive to truck all these lovers in. Relevant Podcast Network.